Hi there, it's Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com here with this week's episode of the Market Monday. This week I'm going to talk about a topic I don't think I've addressed on Market Monday before, but it is just some of the criteria that I take before I invest in particular cards. Now this, I haven't talked about this yet. This is a lot of the coming soon, this year and early next year to Magic the Gathering, and it seems like we're gonna have another year of the reprints. In fact, this is a lot of reprints that are coming down um, that they've announced, yeah, up until, yeah, full year from today, and it's quite significant. And so that makes it very, very awkward when you're a an investor or a speculator on speculating on certain cards. I've been killed in the past by specking on a card that then gets reprinted. Uh, Scavenging News is one of those. I thought there was no way that that card was going to be reprinted so quickly in Modern Masters, and yet it was. And so that is what we're going to explore, that little topic of what are the criteria that I take before I invest in a card. The first one is, has the card been around long enough since it's been in a standard or since it's been printed in whatever the set that it came out of? Um, usually I say it takes about two years for after it has been rotated for a card to start to gain value. That's what I was looking at scavenging news, for example, and cards like Mutavault because they had reached that two year, uh, kind of quota and they will start to go up in value. I'm going to show you a few examples here and a few sets that I'm starting to look at some of the staple cards, uh, for cards that have potential of going up. Um, so there is no rush to invest in those particular cards. I always get questions, well, what do you think about this card? And they're talking about a standard card, uh, Collective Brutality, for example. No, uh, that is a card that is currently still in standard. Uh, same thing with like all of the Eldrazi's from Oath of the Gatewatch. Those you have time, you have plenty of time and kind of stagnant money is dead money. It's if you're investing in a card that's just like holding, like if you if you go on Thought Not Seer, which I don't think is a terrible idea right now to invest in Thought Not Seers because they've proven themselves as the number two deck in modern as the Eldrazi Tron. And as it, it seems to not, it's it's one of those decks that's just really good um, in a number of different metas. Same with Death Shadow. That's, they're very consistent. Affinity is one of those I put on that list. But they, 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 been recently reprinted in a set that had full art lands that people bought uh, a ton of as well as the masterpieces or their expeditions uh were quite new had a wasteland x uh masterpiece and that set sold and sold and sold and so it's going to take a while for these type of cards to go up in value and second of all you people underestimate the number of casual standard players that might have thought not seers or mattery shapers or collective brutalities in their standard decks that have no interest in going into modern that are going to put those back into the market as soon as rotation occurs so that would be my number one advice is look at the, the kind of the 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 uh, the longevity of the set it's got it's got to be rotated for about a year and a half to two years uh, before or after the set has been released, like Modern Masters, for example. Modern Masters 2015 barely started to go up in price right when Modern Masters 2017 was printed. The second of, of those, well, that I, well, let's just, let's just go ahead and look at that right now. So let's just pull up a set of, uh, whoop, that's movers and shakers here. So we'll go to the price list and you can start to see that this happening with, so Constantark here is pretty much flat. It is the the fetch lines did go up a little bit from the modern masters at, or modern having kind of a uh, resurgence with modern masters 2017, but sets like the uh, Konzatar here and Fate Reforged they're pretty much flatlined at the moment because they've been rotated for about a year now. Uh, it, after when this next rotation comes, it'll be the second year that they've been rotated. So the rotation before that, which would be the uh, Theros is you are starting to see this trajectory up. So it flatlined, flat, 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 flat here, and then started to go up uh, about the, the release of Kaladesh and is is starting to go up quite significantly. A lot of it does come from the top two cards or the top three cards, the Elspeth, the Perforos, and the Thoughtseize. But you can see some of these other cards starting to uh, go up in value, like the Ashoks, the Thosses, even Xanagos has been going up. These six cents per week, these things creep up on you. And you give that, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight weeks, you're up to a quarter, up to 50 cents. And then a year, two years down the road, that 
quarter to 50 cents per quarter uh, ends up being a $2 to $3 gain. And then it keeps exponentially going up percentiles wise. And then you have a card that has as quite the increase. So Theros would be a good example of a set that I start looking at cards to invest in. Uh, and then uh, they'd start to actually be not dead money. They'd actually be making money rather than staying stagnant. All right, another set just while we're on it, as I really do like conspiracy. Uh, conspiracy number one, we were looking at it early, and there is a lot of cards that I had no idea uh, were as valuable as they were. This set, a lot of the value was held in Dak Faden. Dak Faden was kind of the, the open up, find either a foil or a Dak Faden, or you lost money on the box. And you can see cards, again, this is a nice steady increase from about Kaladesh. So the same trajectory that we saw with Theros, it's gone up a good $7 set value um, since, since Kaladesh and before then it was pretty much flatlined. So you can see that like the pernicious deed, even though it says going down here, the stifles, things like that are starting to go up. And it was really funny that we found like the death rate ritual, for example, a dollar for an uncommon from this set. And when this, this card first came out, it was definitely a quarter. Yeah, it was, yep, quarter for a long time. It's just been steadily going up. So you can see the flat line it July of or June of 2014 is when the set was released. It stays stagnant for about two years. So you can say January of 2016 and then starts to go up. And now it really starts to go up about here as the supply is outstripped uh, or the demand is outstripped the supply. So be, that is the first criteria. It needs to have this whole block has very little uh or has lots of investable opportunity, but has very little potential of growing for this time period. This is how long it takes for a magic card to start to gain value, which is really important when you're an investor is just knowing the cycles of uh, Magic the Gathering. Like, like it's so predictable. I like to give examples of when I was a World of Warcraft auction house guru. Uh, you always would wait, there'd be a, a, a cyclical nature to the market. It'd be patch notes, like whenever a patch was released, or whenever new, uh, yeah, or, or, or like when they nerfed a, a particular um, character, then another one would uh, go up. And the same thing can be true with Magic. Magic has a lot of cyclical things with, with new set releases with, you can look at uh, decks that are, are starting to trend well, and then you just give it time and like clockwork, those cards will go up in value. The second major criteria that I have for investing in uh, cards is to make sure that they have an an un, uncommon name. What I mean by that is is there are a lot of cards that are very easy easy to be reprinted. And bringing back the core set of 2019 is going to be another game changer again because they've already stated now that they're going to increase the amount of reprinted cards to 50% of cards in the core sets. And so these are going to be your 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 pithing needles. These are going to be. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other kind of generic cards that people want in the scavenging oozes now uh, of that are going to be in these core sets. C cards that have very generic common names, but are hard to just throw in a, a block set without kind of ruining the block or just not having the, the creative space in the block. And so right now I am going to shy away, especially with all these reprints from very common uh, generic names. What you look for is cards that are from particular planes that aren't being, uh, we're not going to that plane. And so going back to Theros block, if everything has a key mechanic or a key name, that is very unlikely that that card gets a reprint in the, the near future. Cards like Scavenging Ooze though, have a, an ability without a key phrase, also have a very, very generic name, and they are just on the chopping block over and over and over for being reprinted. So it is, it's safer to find those uh, Inquisition of Kozlik, for example. It's very, very hard to reprint in in Inquisition of Kozlik. They had to find two sets outside of standard sets to reprint that because it had the name of the you know, Kozilek. Same thing with the Serum Vision. Ser Serum was, was talking about the Blink Moth or the Blink or the, the Serum from the... Uh, the dark steel, I don't know the stupid um, lore to it, but I mean it was a very set specific uh, mechanic, and it was very very hard for them to just throw it in another set, even though it needed a desperate reprint. So when going back to cards, I I give a little bit of a a, a tick up to cards that have a either a very specific mechanic that isn't going to be reprinted anytime soon, or 
a very, very non-generic name, so a very lore-based name for that block set. The last and final thing is to look at upcoming places uh, or upcoming sets that they are going to be reprinting. And here's this list. You can find this if you just type in uh, coming soon MTG on Google. This will show up on the, the mothership here is to look at sets that are coming out and try to anticipate cards that you think will, will be reprinted and s avoid those and then try to find the ones that you don't think are going to be reprinted. So we have some goodies here to start looking forward to commander is already they've already said this commander 2017 edition we've already seen some specific cards for the dragons are going to be tribal based cards so for example you might want to avoid any specific cards you think are going to once the tribes are going to be spoiled which is going to be soon because this is august this is creeping up quick on us um you want to invest in those particular cards that you are are, are, are again quite hard to be printed but will go really well with these cards coming out of the Commander 2017. So uh, cards like Cavern of Souls are going to have an uptick just because there's another tribal uh, set being released. If you go over to Merfolk versus Goblins, there's a lot of speculation on what that could be. And I'm really thinking that these are going to be two-colored decks. I'm thinking they're going to go back to the Lorewind colors of white-blue for Merfolk and red-black for Goblins. I think that just makes it more uh, a lot of lot better targets to be pr printed and not just be so mono focused but i mean it really could be a mono focus people have talked about master of waves being a card that is going to be reprinted for merfolk and i don't th i think it's too narrow for what they want to be doing and other people have talked about like prime speaker prime speaker zagana for example but my bet is on the white blue uh, merfolk so you can you can take the gamble and invest in things you don't think are going to be in the the set and sell things you do think are going to be in the, in the set and or you can just wait for it that when it's immediately spoiled to then find cards that were not reprinted in the uh, this particular set and then pull the trigger on them. For for example, if Lord of of Atlantis is not in this set, then you pick up Lord of Atlantis and before the masses start doing so again it's going to take about one month to two months after the set is released we really saw that with commander with the uh cards like the um, uh the, the the doubling season went crazy from uh, atraxa uh nim's death mantle went crazy because of brea cards like that they, they usually take a while before they start to the supply starts to get outstretched by the demand and that's when you pull the trigger so those are my kind of my three criterias when you're we're looking for the future to an, invest in particular cards now on to another strategy which is really really relevant for right now is we have access to spoiler season and spoiler season people are getting a lot better than they used to in fact they're a lot more reckless we saw that like madcap experiment going crazy like making the some of those cards go crazy uh the platinum aperium and i'm trying to think of the other card that went crazy off of it and we've seen a lot of things actually even bust uh i made a lot off of the when the as foretold was spoiled i went all in on the uh zero cost restore balance and basically doubled my money on restore balance a little bit of uh shameless self-promotion here i try to give out tweets I guess tweets isn't the right uh, thing to my patrons. If you're a patron at any level over at Patreon, uh, a patron of mine, ro uh, patrons slash rogue deck builder, I try to give out some market tweets uh, to cards that go up. And that was one of them that I, I particularly did mention was the restore balance. And I think I bought over 40, co 40 copies at $2 a piece and we sold out at 650 ish, I believe. So it's it, there, there's a lot of money to be made just to look at spoilers and get ahead. Uh, follow a lot of the finance guys on Twitter. Um, the like the the cartel aristocrats are great ones to follow. Like Jeremy, a lengthy Zemet. He often tweets out things that stuff that he's buying. Um, we also have people from like the Brainstorm Brewery that that often are, are are ahead of their tweets. Jeff Hoogland is he's been brewing more and more lately, and he's been tweeting out like things that he's been using uh recently in brews or theory crafting and things like that and just a lot of times the buzz that they create look at star city games look at channel fireball look at all those those type of of uh, the bigger channels and just the buzz that they create will often cause a lot of price increases so we're going to go on that and one of these that, that people really uh was the the card that just came out which is solemnity of from hour of devastation now this card says players can't get counters and counters can't be put on artifacts creatures enchantments or lands so people automatically 
automatically started looking at the cards that would, would work really well with these cards. So for example, here was Glacial Chasm. I was gone this week, so of course I couldn't get in on this hype, uh, as Glacial Chasm has the cumulative upkeep. Anything with cumulative upkeep cannot have counters put upon them. So it's, it's worthwhile to go back to Ice Age. There's probably some other ones that have been spiking and see anything else that has been going up. You just click on this weekly change here, it will show you. And a lot of these, yep, cumulative upkeep right here, this Infernal Darkness is starting to actually creep up uh, because of it might have some synergy with the Solemnity, uh, as well as other cards that have cumulative upkeep. I'm trying to think of some of them that were actually really good. Uh, back, I don't know why these are going up. They're being reprinted in a, a set coming up. Uh, but Illusions of Grandeur, for example, the cumulative upkeep does not happen anymore. So you just this is a four mana spell where you just gain 20 life. All of these actually look really good to invest in. Of course, Glacial Chasm was the uh, card that was the kind of the duh card. And some other cards that people have been working on is the Phyrexian Unlife. And it spike is, is spiking up in value again because of the card. People are thinking of putting this in an Enduring Ideal enchantment deck where you get the Phyrexian Unlife, you get the Solemnity, you get, then you start getting all these other cards. And then pretty much um, they're, they're actually doing it with this Overwhelming Splendor as well. Pretty much you, you, you lock out the game. You can't, you can't lose the game by damage. Your, your, creatures lose all, or your opponent's creatures lose all their abilities. And it's, it almost works like a Hate Bearer's Death and Taxes type strategy where your opponent doesn't get to play the game. And eventually you, you'll find your win con and just uh, uh, win the game outright. So speaking of the Solemnity, I guess we'll just get to my top three picks of cards that I am investing in at this moment because of recently spoiled cards. So let's just talk about these spoiled cards and then, then we'll type in the cards that I'm investing in. So Solemnity has those kind of duh cards. The other things that, that can't get counters, there is a lot of cards that enter with like counters that are negative. Uh, this recent set, this Omniket had a bunch of cards that enter with negative one and one counters. Well, I'll take that away and now you have a 5-4 Haster for th uh, three mana, for example. There's a lot of cards that pair very well taking away this. Of course, Infect is one of those things. Anything that, that negatively gives you counters or negatively gives your creatures counters um, is really, really powerful. Like same thing with Undying uh, and Undying and the uh, the Persist also combo with the, the Solemnity. But one of the cards I think that is is kind of the that, that pairs even better is with this card is Thing in the Ice. And Thing in the Ice is at an all time, I believe an all time low at this point. So if we look at Thing in the Ice, and I, I know I just recently said at the beginning of this, don't invest in cards, you have time, blah, 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 blah. This is kind of an exception to the rule because this card is at its all time low and it's also proven itself. It sees play in Legacy, Modern and Standard. And this is gonna be a standard card uh, combo that is going to be in Standard for at least three months. So it might be worthwhile to pick up this combo if people are like, okay, it, the, what I like about this too is it does have uh, a pretty decent curve with Thing in the Ice. So you go Solemnity and then drop Thing in the Ice and then cast a spell and then it flips into a 7-8 and throws all non-horror creatures back to their hand. And you can just get a lot of value out of that. And I think there's enough in standard to pair it with other, other negative uh, uh, things that don't want counters. Um, it also screws up your opponents, um, like the green black type strategy, even though I don't, I don't think that you should be running sideboard cards to combat like green black energy. If it ends up being a main card, like card that exists within the strategy, then that is just awesome. I ran a, a deck that was very similar to that when people were running like a lot of the Eldrazi temples and the Eye of Ugins. I was running Painter Servant. Uh, with Tesa, because not I wouldn't run Painter Servant just to try to stop the Eldrazi, but when it stops the number one deck and it pairs with another card, that's where I think you found gold. And so for Solemnity, I don't think that maybe you've missed the mark on Glacial Chasm, uh, Dark Depths, and the Phyrexian Unlife. Thing of the Ice is at the lowest it has ever been. And a card that has proven itself, a card that comes back every now and again, yes, Fatal Push has been really hurting the thing in the ice for modern. Uh, it started to see a lot of play and it looks like it's completely gone away in a red blue spells in modern and then fatal push was um, printed and then this card kind of same thing in standard. 
Thinking the Ice is a lot more of a liability to try to... People liked it at first because it could dodge some... It could dodge a lightning bolt in Modern, but um, with Grass of Darkness and Fatal Push, it's kind of been overshadowed by other cards that don't outright just die to those cards. However, Thing in the Ice, though, with this, could it be potentially something that gets value immediately when you drop, drop it on turn four and cast a spell. And then, of course, looking back, Channel Fireball just wrote an article about a legacy deck where they're running all four of the cards that pair with Solemnity. I think this card has the opportunity to have a nice gain before rotation happens, and it can actually might hold value um, you know, it might go back up to this this whole, whole like eight dollar mark and hold its value, and then start going up into. I mean, this could be the new baseline after rotation. So that's one of the cards I'm definitely keeping my eye on. If more people start, there's more buzz in those you know Twitter circles in the channel fireballs to Star City Games. Then I'll pull the trigger on the thing in the ice. The next card that is kind of my penny stocks. Um, pick is this overwhelming splendor again people are talking about enduring ideal as a way just to go and then grab a bunch of different win conditions because enduring ideal has that epic where you can't cast spells and then right let's pull up enduring ideal real quick to see exactly how it's worded because it's got the epic so you can't cast spells for the rest of the games and then you search your life for enchantment card each turn so each turn you get a free enchantment spell and so with enduring ideal what they're gonna you're gonna do is this will be one of the cards that then shuts down opponents activated abilities and puts them to, to one ones and then after that you'll you'll end up go and getting some of their other win cons people have already said okay we're gonna run an enchantment deck like an enchantress deck in legacy or in modern there is uh, a, an enchantment deck that then even Frontier, this gets really... Oh, that can, I guess Enduring Ideal can be played in Frontier, but um, you can go get a bunch of just enchantments to lock out the game and eventually be the win con. And But where I kind of like this Overruling Splendor is it really makes me think that the curses are going to become more of an evergreen mechanic. We did see them in the, the Innistrad block, the original Innistrad block, and then the second Innistrad block. And now we've seen a few per set be printed in Amonkhet. And so the what I really like about curses is there's definitely enough now. I've been selling a lot at the store to casual players. That's one thing that I have an advantage over other speculators is I get to see the day-to-day -day sales to these people that never play in tournaments. They just come in, buy cards, and leave. And I've sold a ton of curses before this card was spoiled just because people were getting curses out of Amonkhet and then trying to build around. And so I think the curse that works the best with the overwhelming splendor is going to be the curse of misfortunes. So this card has been pretty much flatlined forever. It has never really gained value since it's printing kind of a, a bulk trashy rare, but it's a very, very powerful curse. It's a five mana curse. Beginning of your upkeep, you may search your library for a curse card that doesn't have the same name as cur a curse attached to enchanted player. Put it on the battlefield attached to that player, then shelf your library. So you think about Enduring Ideal. Enduring Ideal is going to go get Overwhelming Splendor. However, Curse of Misfortunes also can do this as well as go get like the win cons because how curses work, the more you start cursing to a player, they all have a, a lot of synergistic effect. There's a black one that makes them lose life for every curse that's out on the battlefield. I can't remember that one's commander specific or not, but there's a red one that does very similar things. There's uh, a new blue curse, right? That the, the causes double mill to happen. I believe there's a curse that mills. Uh, so, but what really makes it, if it's more of this, this keyword, this evergreen, this curse that we're going to be more and more curses that this card just seems to be, in the casual perspective, will have more and more demand as time goes on. I saw the light about, it's been for a couple of years now that I've, 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 I have a vision of the new investing in magic where casual players are, is a lot more lucrative to speculate into casual than it is in competitive because the there are so many sharks in the competitive world. People tend to gravitate to what's familiar. So, if you know the market for modern, for example, you're going to invest in modern. You're not going to like go to some place that you're not unfamiliar with. And so I think as a speculator, there's a lot more ground in the casual cards uh, to occupy than there is to try to compete with these bigger vendors that already kind of cornered the market with modern. The days of where, if you go back to some of like my early, early episodes of Mark, uh, it wasn't called Market Monday, it was called the Rogue Market. Clear back in the day, I was all in on modern and all my specs always were modern, 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 modern. If it wasn't modern, then who cared? And it, it made me a, 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 a nice chunk of change 
for those years. But even as as we go further and further down the road, it becomes harder and harder to invest in modern because there's more people that have kind of uh, cornered that type of market. Anyways, let's let's go back to the the curses. There are a few other curses, but this one just seems criminally undervalued at the moment at a quarter a piece. And we actually bought out most of the copies. There was some for 12, 13 cents. I believe we spent like 25 bucks in curses and there's a hundred cards coming to us. And it's something that I don't think that there's any real, uh, it's gonna hold its value. It's gonna continue this flat line. You'll trade, like, as, again, as a store owner, it's a lot easier for me to unload these because this is real cash that then I can, you know, uh, a person comes in and wants a play set of them. So it's a dollar. And so I make my money back at least and make it, you know, bought it for 12 cents, sold it for a quarter. Uh, not huge profits, but if this goes up to a dollar or a dollar 50, that's a pretty good chunk of change that I was able to accrue from just a, a very, very easy spec based upon a kind of just a keyword curse being printed and at least a curse that's worth that. I think this is something we've been missing with the curse of misfortunes is the ramp aspect to it. This can go from a five and then the next turn go into an eight mana curse. And so if this is, this is going to be something they're going to be printing more and more down the road. Uh, yeah, more power to this curse of misfortunes. Last but not least, which might be a little bit of a, people have speculated this might be one of the tribes that's coming out in the commander 20, uh, 2017, which is demons. But I really like the Shadow Shadow Shadowborn Apostle here with Roz, Rozaketh the Foul Blooded. This card spikes every time there's a new uh, demon that comes out. Every time this a new demon comes out, this card specs up. The highest it's ever been is a dollar eighty. It's approaching its highest ever again without the card being spoiled. Now the card is spoiled. If there was a zombie that or a, a, a demon that ever did synergize with this Shadowborn Apostle. People were thinking Gristlebrand was good. This card's insane. With It also gives you another target in, in case you accidentally drew your Gristlebrand, for example. Uh, but in Commander, it gives you a Commander... Of course, you're not going to run this as your Commander, but it gives you a nice little spec target for the, the Shadowborn Apostle, or not spec tar a target, which is Rosaketh the Foul-Blooded, which makes it really good for your, your Shadowborn Apostles after you uh, go the combo. So once you get the Shadowborn Apostle and you draw another Shadowborn Apostle, sacrifice it and go get any card just by paying two life. So I think this is going to be a casual hit. A lot of people are going to want to build a commander deck. Not really out of this, but including this. I know my Balfour the Defiled deck will want it. And, you know, we, we these are the targets. The Runescar Demon and the, the Gristle Brand were definitely targets that people usually got with the Shadowborn uh, Apostles. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that people got. The, the, that's a Praetor that I'm thinking of. It's not a demon. Uh, but yeah, I think the Shadowborn Apostle is due for another hefty price increase. What makes this kind of crazy is, as a common is a deck can have as many as they want. So it doesn't exist to that four per deck rule. And the sky is the limit for how much this common. I'm, I'm thinking three to four bucks is going to be the, uh, eh, maybe that's a little bit wishful thinking. But 250 to three bucks, I would say, is probably safe. Uh, once this set is completely out and people start pumping this, uh, the Shadow War Impossible into those those particular decks. So those would be my three picks just based upon the cards that have been spoiled out of the Hour of Devastation. So during spoiler season as a speculator, that is a huge time. There are very important times to be looking. One of them is a Pro Tour at, or a major modern tournament. Those are two times you should be glued to your monitor and just be looking at trends, looking at decks that are performing well. And the other one is definitely spoiler season because once a card is spoiled, you have a very, very small window to really invest in those. Once a, once a, a combo is identified, the the speculators are going to jump in on it. So it's either miss the mark or get in it with, with them. And so be looking forward. Uh, like So Saturday and Sunday, they usually don't spoil anything, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all those days, Definitely, this mythic spoiler is something that should be bookmarked and, and refreshed quite a bit, uh, and and just really put on those brewers uh, hats. What do we call ourselves? And and then figure out what could combo with these type of pieces. And it won't be too long before someone else identifies the combo and the buying spree commences. So that's kind of this week's Market Monday. I hope there's some useful information on it. Uh, we'll get back to. I had like a whole plan. We're almost up to 30 minutes already 
for this Market Monday. But um, I, I, I'll do modern probably next week. I think we're going to be focused still on the spoiler season. I do have a guest coming on uh, in a few days. We're going to talk about the MTGO economy and how the economy is really, really bad for drafters. I just thought, you know, what, what changes need to be done for limited players to actually have value again back in MTGO. But I'm going to actually focus on some of the MTGO uh, economy as well. I've had a lot of requests for that. And MTGO is a whole different beast. The way that treasures work it is a very cyclical, like I just got out of Chandra's, for example. I'm just going to talk just briefly here on MTGO. And I use four of these in a deck. But you should never, ever, unless, oops, not that one. Chandra from Kaladesh. Wrong Chandra from Kaladesh. If I can think of what the Chandra is called. Uh, we'll still get. It'll be the number one card here. Torch of Defiance. Yeah, that's right. So Chandra Torch of Defiance on Magic Online has spiked up to $32. And this is always when I sell because the, the way that treasure chests work is once wizard sees that this is a card that needs to be back in the system, they'll put it in treasures and then it, it kind of goes back down in value quite, quite quickly. So that's just something, uh, even though I use these in decks, the, uh, the economy with empty Joe is a whole different beast. that is very, very regulated by wizards ability to just shove them into treasures. So whenever something does spike, I sell. So the very first thing I do is you look at the prices, movers, and shakers for online. And anything that has like a significant increase for the weekly change, I get out of. So same thing at Kozik's Return. I'll probably end up selling Kozik's Return here. Uh, just in anticipation for rotation. Looks like maybe people are starting to find another. Uh, this deck might be having some. Oh, Metalwork Colossus. Yeah, this is having a resurgence uh, right now in Standard. And they are running the Kozik's Return, so it's causing a buyout spree. Uh, but Wizard sees this, they usually put them in treasures again, and that will start to regulate. The, the supply will then enter the market and kind of suffice the demand. And so I'll talk about some more tips and, and tricks for MTG on a whole different episode. But I hope you enjoyed this Market Monday. Uh, as always, looking in the forward in the comment section below of, three, of your three picks of cards that I think for this topic for this week that are impacted because of spoiler season. So if there's any that I've just flat out missed, any spoiler cards that I think... Um, I really like the uh, the menagerie card, the 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 card that allows you to go get the X and two the the two green and X spell. I think that that probably has some pretty sweet combos uh, to it as well. It just seems like a ranger of Eos on crack. So anyway, looking forward to your comments in the comment section below. This has been Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com. Thanks for watching.